Uh, the first case is um, AFT Michigan versus State of Michigan. Um, Mr. Gordon, I understand you're going to be arguing the entire argument for your side. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Okay, that will not be true of the other side. Is that also correct? correct. Do you understand you'll be splitting time, the three of you? Yes. Okay. You have to manage the time, as always, right? Okay. Please proceed, Mr. Gordon. Thank you, Your Honor. I would like to uh, reserve uh, five minutes for rebuttal. That's fine. My name is Gary Gordon. At council table with me is Alan Wilk. We have been designated uh, Special <coughs> Assistant Attorneys General for purposes of representing the state appellants in these three consolidated cases. We believe these cases present two primary issues, one of which uh, the court does not need to address depending on the ruling on the first. The first issue is the applicability of PA 300 to Act 75, which this court referred to the Court of Appeals to consider. If the court rules that it is directly applicable, the court, in following its precedent, does not need to address the constitutional issues that were independently raised by the Court of Appeals and have been briefed before this court. As all are aware, and, and I'm going to give a very brief uh, a fact description, although I know the court is familiar with it, but as all are aware, you're, uh, the, the state of Michigan and the retirement uh, fund specifically were in dire straits prior to enactment of Act 75. Uh, there was a deficit of approximately $47.2 billion with $27.6 billion attributed to retiree health care expenses. The legislature addressed this by making a policy decision which the legislature and the legislature alone uh, is allowed to make that it would require uh, public employees who are employed by schools to contribute three, up to 3% of their wages into a trust account whose purpose is specifically limited to payment of a fraction of the health care cost. This was Act 75. It was found unconstitutional on several grounds by the Court of Appeals, and the money that had been placed into this fund, uh, currently uh, approximately $550 million, was ordered to place in escrow. That's where it resides today. In response to the Court of Appeals' decision on constitutionality, the legislature shortly thereafter enacted Act uh, PA. 300 in 2012. It gave that act immediate effect and specifically made the act applicable to all members of the retirement fund who had become members prior to enactment of the statute. It kept intact Act 75 but added a new section uh, 91A5 that allows <clears throat> excuse me, current public school employees to opt out of retirement health care so they didn't have to pay the 3% and established a separate retirement allowance for those who paid the 3% but subsequently didn't qualify for any benefits. In other words, in, under Act uh, 300, all persons who contributed to the fund are protected. They will be made whole if they don't vest uh, for retirement benefits or the money will be uh, uh, paid back to them uh, as part of a deferred compensation account in amounts at least equal to the contributions into the fund. It was made, uh, uh, the specific language uh, making the uh, Act 300 applicable to the employees who paid into the fund under Act 75 is as follows, <clears throat> excuse me, quote, except as otherwise provided in this section or section 91A, each member who first became a member before September 4, 2012. That clearly evidences an intent by the legislature in its clear language that doesn't need any interpretation whatsoever that this act is applicable to all persons who became members before 2012 and that applies to all plaintiffs. The unions unsuccessfully attacked the new legislation I'm, and I refer to the uh, defendants collectively as the unions, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, appellees. Um, on, on almost identical grounds as they attacked uh, Act 75. 
this court and the Court of Appeals both upheld the constitutionality of Act 300, and you remanded it to the Court of Appeals with specific instructions. We believe the Court of Appeals ignored those instructions, went beyond those instructions, and, and uh, followed its own path, which is why we filed our application for leave to appeal to this court. This court specifically stated, and I quote, uh, or Counsel, the isn't court, the only way to make the people, the teachers, like whole through money? Pardon me? Isn't the only way to make them whole is through payment? And Act 300 provides for payment. Everybody who's paid into that act doesn't that pay, fund. but it doesn't provide cash. It's, uh, it, it specifically doesn't provide for payment in actual funds, does it? Yes, it does. They mm -hmm. will either uh, receive, if they cho choose to opt in, continue into the health care plan, health care, or they will receive a refund of at least everything they put into the fund as part of a uh, uh, deferred comp when they eventually retire. For, but they don't leave. get it now. They don't get it now. Right. They will get it plus interest when they do retire. That's but correct. But isn't that really one of the fundamental concerns of the, uh, of the whole situation? Isn't this like a problem for your case that they don't get it now? I don't believe so because, number one, uh, we will argue or have argued that Act 75 truly is not unconstitutional. It, it was not an improper taking. The taking was not for the benefit of so the what state. So what, what is it? Is it a tax? What exactly is this? It's a, it's, uh, could be construed to be a tax. I a see. Well, well, so it's a tax. Okay. So if it's a tax, is this just a special tax for teachers? Well, I mean, it, it's yeah, well, wait, 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 you said it was a tax. So if it's a tax, is this a specific tax for teachers? I I'm, said I'm, it, so if I'm a teacher, I'm going to pay this. It's a tax exclusively for teachers. It is. It is. I misspoke. It's more in the nature of a user fee. That well, you the, said it was a tax. These, I did. But that's I, a critical element here, because if you said it's a tax, it, be, then sorry. you can't. You can't seem. My my question is, if you said it's a tax. My follow-up question to you is, is it a specialized tax which is exclusive to just teachers? If it is a tax, okay. it is special to the teachers who are the only people who receive the benefit of that tax. What was, what was the benefit that they received in this situation? The, the benefit? In the, in, the first, in the first enactment, what, explain to me specifically what was the exact benefit that they received? The benefit they receive is to continue the viability of the retirees' health care. But that wasn't for those specific people, was it? It is if you're going to retire, the viability of the health, and they also received current death and disability benefits from these payments. The viability of the system. But how do you have a, the viability of the system, so what were the other steps? I mean, if, if I'm going to go through the steps that you're talking about, what were the other steps that were taken before they took this, this act to tax them 3%? I mean, if you're looking at the statute and well, you're looking at kind for, of what has to be done, what, what were the other things that they did before they, what was the necessity that got to this point? The necessity was a uh, $47 million, billion dollar deficit with $27 billion. And what specific steps were taken before they, they, they went after the teachers for the 3%. Well, this is the teacher's uh, health fund. It's only uh, for, well, not just teachers, public school employees fund. And it only addresses the health care benefits of public school employees. The money that these public school employees contribute is used for their own specific purposes to maintain the viability of the plan to provide, and under Act 75 to provide them excuse me, death and disability benefits, but they receive... But you still haven't answered my question, which is, how is this a ta how can you have a tax that is specialized on a specific group of people? Well, I'm, I'm just trying to understand how that's possible. How, if I'm a teacher, I'm going to pay a special teaching tax, a teacher's I, I, tax? I, mis I misspoke. It, it, can, it is more in the nature of a user fee. It benefits only the teachers, only the people that contribute, nobody else. It doesn't benefit the state. It doesn't benefit any. Uh, it goes strictly to 
their own health care and to maintain the viability of the program. Uh, it's a, an advanced funding of that, something like Social Security. But how do you get around this issue of substantial impairment in terms of, you know, it's, it's been held that takings that were substantially less constituted an impairment. So here you have 3%. So how yes. do we get around that? Well, you get around that because those cases and the analysis dealing with substantial impairment dealt with impairment to benefit somebody other than the, the persons providing the fund. Here, uh, the, the takings cases cited in the plaintiff's briefs deal with money that was removed or, 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 or uh, from uh, the uh, contributors and utilized for a purpose not directly benefiting the contributors. So one of the miles, one of the steps in any takings analysis in order to determine whether it is substantial enough or not is to look at the proportionality of that to quote uh, Justice Markman in his decision in AFT. The proportionality of this and the benefit received by the employees far exceeds the value of, uh, uh, that they will receive because of the uh, cost of health care benefits if they maintain uh, uh, the program and, and eventually uh, vest for health care benefits. If they don't, then they receive all of the money back. And if they all receive all of the money back uh, eventually, then uh, it really doesn't uh, meet the definition of a taking because a taking is a removal permanently of, of the funds and a removal of the funds uh, to, uh, uh, for the purposes uh, but then we're back to our same. We're state. back to our same discussion, which is, they don't get the they get the money back. They don't they don't get the money immediately back. You basically took mm -hmm. the money from them. This has been for a number of years, and if a person's, I mean, you don't concede that if a person's making a certain limited amounts of funds, that they rely on that funds to basically pay their car insurance or to pay for their home or to do basic things like that. So. You, that, that is the problem with the, the new, even when you have the, the constitutional question comes back again, because you're still left, even with the enactment of the second statute, you're still left with that same issue, are you not? No. This is similar, akin to uh, uh, Social Security. You don't get that money back if the federal government has decided, which they have, that's your Social Security contribution. But this isn't Social Security. This was, this was that there was a contractual agreement. There was a contract you that know, was, that basically, this was a, wasn't this not a bargain for thing? And now all of a sudden, you have a contract, correct? No, with all due respect, there was not a contract between the state of Michigan and the employees. There was no contract uh, between the, uh, the uh, contributors and the uh, employer that they not ever be allowed to contribute to a retirement fund. There is no contract directly impacted by this. The contract has to, in order for there to be a violation of the contracts clause, the number one, there has to be a contract. The state of Michigan isn't part of a contract. These employees are still receiving compensation, just like you receive. Who do they contract with? I assume they contract with the, uh, with the school districts, right. that, but we don't believe, I don't believe any contracts were ever uh, submitted into the record. I'm not sure, but there was no reference at any point to any specific collective bargaining agreement. So we're operating under an assumption, and if you want to assume that there was a contract, and if you want to assume that a contract uh, provided that somebody is to be paid a certain amount of money in compensation, they are still receiving that compensation, that value from the school district. What they are having to do, though, is to contribute a portion of that compensation to uh, a program to which they and they alone benefit, and that is the retiree health care eventually, or if they don't want to do that under Act 300, any money that any of these people have contributed will be returned to them eventually with interest. So nobody is being harmed. Uh, the, the Court of Appeals, the, the direction to the Court of Appeals by this court was to, quote, consider what issues presented in these cases 
have been superseded by the enactment of Act 300 and this Court's decision upholding that Act and to only address any outstanding issues the parties may raise regarding Act 75 that were not superseded or otherwise rendered moot. That's clear direction. The Court of Appeals took that direction and in footnote 11 restated uh, the issue not the issue that this court directed them to examine. They stated, quote, the issue before us is whether 210 PA 75 was constitutional prior to the effective date of 212 PA 300. If, as we conclude, it was not, then the collection of the subject funds was unlawful and they must be returned. Mm -hmm. So the Court of Appeals didn't follow your direction, didn't address the issue that you posed, and follow their own path to reach the same conclusion, the same analysis that they had already reached in the first case. Act 300, I, I think, uh, without question, because of the specific language of the legislation, supersedes Act 75 and, has, and provides for the refund of these funds. Act 300 provides an opportunity for opt-out and, uh, and if some, nobody ever vests, then they get the money back in some form or another, uh, and that is protected uh, by the trust fund, not a, uh, some other fund, it's not the general fund, it's a trust fund specifically designated to receive those funds. Does Act 300 ever specifically refer to the funds collected before its effective date? No, it's, it specifically refers to all uh, all uh, the language I quoted, let me, excuse me, uh, except as otherwise provided, this applies each, or each member who first became a member before September 4, 2012. What section are you referring to? Pardon me? Which, which section, subsection? That is in section 43E. That was the amendment. So by its specific language, it provided that uh, it applied to anybody who became a member. It could, can't mean anything else. It's, it's clear and any, any analysis by this court, of course, begins with uh, examination of the statutory language itself. If it needs no interpretation or construction, it stands by itself. <clears throat> this is one of those instances. So you think that language is pertaining to the contributions of those people pre-statute? Yes not just the persons, but the, the particular contributions from those persons. That's correct. The, 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 the persons made the contributions. Uh, they could have included language within the Act to say that this doesn't apply to any contributions of persons who became a member before uh, the Act, the effective date of Act 300, but they didn't. They made it clear, and the timing of the Act it, uh, made it clear that it was in reaction to the Court of Appeals concerns, which we do not concede are valid, but it was in reaction to those concerns and tried to repair the act. Can you help me understand um, the difference concerning whether this, this implicates any sense of retroactivity and why there's disagreement on that characterization? Yes, Your Honor, or yes, uh, Justice Markman. We cited uh, uh, a couple of cases, one dealing with uh, uh, increase in benefits to workers' comp compensation uh, recipients. The question was raised and, and it was made effective that date moving forward. The question was raised that, well, does it apply to people who are already injured or not? Because if it, uh, and if so, or if that was the intent, was the statute required to state that it, would, it should be applied retroactively, and the statute didn't. And this court found that no, this, this applies to recipients uh, you know, who are injured under workers' compensation. It didn't, uh, and, and it said that the benefits are uh, increased on this date forward. It wasn't, uh, and, and that's very similar to this case. This states that this applies to the funds, it, uh, this applies to the people and to the funds uh, who, that were collected by people who became members prior to 2012. Isn't the problem that it doesn't say the funds? It just says to the people. 
Well, the, 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 the funds, then we wouldn't have a retroactivity problem. The, the, then it would the, specifically relate to the funds that are at issue in this case. The, 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 we're talking about the impact to uh, the employees and the funds they contributed and that they have. Uh, uh, but it says it to the people who are a member who first became a member before September 4, 2012, shall contribute 3% of the member's compensation, wouldn't a reasonable be interpretation mean after the effective day of the act on a going forward basis? That's what's going well, to happen to that group of people? I believe if you keep reading, it talks about the, the application of these funds and the treatment of these funds. It talks about the funds under PA 77 uh, that will be deposited into this trust fund. And, and kept and utilized for the sole and exclusive uh, benefit of those who contribute to it. None of that requires the conclusion, though, that it's referring to previously existing funds, right? Previously paid funds. All of that would be a reasonable interpretation of what to do with the funds that will be collected on a going forward basis, right? Well, I think that this, no, I, I, I respectfully disagree. Because the states well, tell accept, me why. Tell me pardon why. me. Tell me why. And point me to the because language. of the specific language of, of uh, section uh, 43e, which states, except as otherwise provided, uh, the, the the phrase you referred to was the con contribution of three percent, uh, or section 91a. Each member who first became a member before September uh, 4, 2012, shall contribute. 3%. If you look at section 91A, uh, and uh, the subsection is subsection 8, it states, uh, except as otherwise, wait, is this 91A? It says, except as otherwise provided under this subsection. The separate retirement act uh, allowance under this subsection shall be paid for 60 months and shall be equal to 1 60th of the amount equal to the contributions made by the member under section 43e. So that refers back to uh, the, uh, the members who uh, uh, were members prior to that date. So this specifically addresses the disposition of those funds. So even without stating the funds in section 43e, it states except as otherwise provided and then makes specific reference to section 91A, 91A subparagraph 8, I think addresses specifically the disposition of those funds. <clears throat> the, uh, so we think that uh, Without needing to go further in your analysis of the constitutionality of Act 75, Act 300, these sections read together as they must be, addresses the concerns raised by the Court of Appeals. Now, the Court of Appeals stated that, and uh, please forgive me uh, while I quote, but they, they focused on uh, and this is in uh, page uh, 440A of our appendix. When they addressed uh, Act 300, and when they addressed Act 75 and AFT 2, the Court of Appeals said the state correctly points out that the escrowed funds are turned over to the state, or that if they're turned over to the state, the funds would be subject to the refund mechanism of 212 PA 300. Court of Appeals agreed with us there. For those employees who ultimately do not qualify re for retirement health care benefits, specifically 91A8 provides that the refunded sum shall be equal to the contributions made by the members under Section 43E. And I'm continuing my quote. I apologize for that. Uh, therefore, it must include the sums collected under 43E from its inception not merely after the modification of 212 PA 300. Therefore, it can be argued that so long as uh, 91A8 remains unaltered and in effect, those employees who do not opt out, but who do not ultimately qualify for benefits will not suffer a constitutional deprivation 
because they will receive back what they put in, including the sums withheld during the mandatory period. But the Court of Appeals went on to say the problem was not that mandatory contributions are in and of themselves unconstitutional. The constitutional problem was and is that the mandated employee contributions were to a system in which the employee contributors have no vested rights. Well, under Act 300, they have rights to receive the money uh, either th and receive the benefits, vastly exceeding any contribution, as Justice Markman noted, uh, in the form of retiree health care benefits or in refunds. But the Court of Appeals analysis is faulty in part because instead of looking at the statutes as they exist, they speculate on what the legislature might do at some point. Maybe the legislature will attempt to modify the benefits that these people receive, and if they do, that means it's not vested, and therefore it's unconstitutional. But that's not the analysis. The court should be limited to looking at the statute as it exists, as it exists today and on its four corners. And as it exists today, those people are going to receive the benefit of a refund or a lifetime or a retiree health care benefits. So all the constitutional infirmities that the Court of Appeals were concerned about were remedied. I see my time is, is waning. We, we uh, have fully briefed in the alternative why we believe that Act 75 is constitutional, issues that this court did not get to in AFT2, in which the Court of Appeals decided improperly. The Court of Appeals did not utilize any, any deference to the legislature. The Court of Appeals did not place any burden of establishing the uh, or overcoming the presumption of constitutionality. Their analysis was, was wrong. I will reserve my time. So be it. Thank you. <clears throat> now, can I just say one thing, please? We're going to have a free, no, no, stay there, okay. please. We're going to have a free fire zone of two minutes for each of you, so there'll be a total of six minutes. It's my understanding that you're aware of that. Please proceed. <clears throat> Justice Markman, Justices of the Supreme Court, my name is Timothy J. DeLugas, and uh, I represent the McMillan plaintiffs in this case. Uh, as you know, there's three consolidated cases. I'm joined by counsel. Uh, for the respective parties at the table. Um, each one of us has been allotted 15 minutes of oral argument by order of this court. Uh, my plan today is to discuss with you uh, why PA 300 uh, was not uh, applicable to the unconstitutional uh, problems with PA 75 and also hope to discuss with you uh, the issues of taking uh, and why PA 75 effectuated an unconstitutional taking. I would waive uh, even my two minute time, uh, your, your honor. Uh, certainly the five minutes would, would have been enough as it is. Uh, the remand in this case, I think Mr. Gordon has addressed uh, the scope of the remand and your, your, the court is quite aware of what its uh, intentions were in, in resending this back to the Court of Appeals. Um, preliminarily, nothing in PA 300 supersedes uh, PA 75, and nor does this court's decision regarding PA 300 supersede uh, the Court of Appeals decision, re initial decision regarding PA 75. Um, you, you have with PA 75 um, and its litigation a mandatory contribution by the school employees. 3% uh, was ordered to be deducted from their paychecks by the legislature and those monies were to be turned over to the state as if they were employer contributions, not the employee's contributions, but the employer's contributions. What happened with PA 300 in September of 2012 was the legislature enacted a completely new statutory scheme, uh, allowing members to voluntarily uh, decide whether they were gonna continue in the retiree health care portion of the uh, Retirement Act uh, and in doing so, deciding whether they were going to undertake the 3% contribution moving forward. Uh, this distinction was, was talked about, I think, in your prior decision under PA 300 because uh, at several times it was noted that unlike 
PA75, the deductions under PA300 were voluntary, whereas the deductions under PA75 were mandatory. This is important to, to keep in mind because we're looking at two completely different <coughs> statutory schemes. <coughs> PA75 um, uh, began uh, basically as, an, as a revenue raising statute, uh, whereas PA300 incorporates now the concept of pre-funding. Um, at the beginning of this um, litigation, I should say, not legislation, two important orders were, were entered by the Court of Claims. First, there was the, the, the probably the more prominent order, which is put the money in an escrow account while we argue about it. And that's what we're here today still uh, litigating, is what happens to the $550 million that was uh, extracted from the paychecks of public employees between July 1, 2010, up until September 4, 2012. The other order that was entered preliminarily uh, or early in the onset of this litigation by the Court of Claims was a stipulated order that uh, wherein the state agreed that if the contributions under PA 75 were deemed to be unconstitutional, they were going to pay everyone back. <coughs> Those are the commitments made early on in the litigation in front of the what would be considered the trial court, the Court of Claims. And those are the commitments that the legislature is presumed to know when it enacted PA 300. Um, from a timeline standpoint, PA 300 began prior to the Court of Appeals decision uh, initially uh, in this case. Uh, SB 1040 began in March of 2012, uh, six months before the Court of Appeals even issued its preliminary decision. At that time, the legislature was already trying to fix what PA 75 uh, had broken. Um, the, uh, Did the legislature, were they successful in that? Because it, it can appear one could say that some of the same problems still exist. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the second half of that. Did the legislature successfully repair it, or do some of the problems still exist? Well, um, this court addressed its, its repair function through PA 300, and this court has deemed that it passed constitutional muster. And the reason being that uh, the statutory scheme implemented by PA 300 um, was now a voluntary program. It was no longer a mandatory deduction with nothing promised in return. Um, the, um, the issue really uh, at stake here is whether or not PA 300 uh, attaches itself to the monies previously taken under PA 75. And there's nothing textually in the statute that would suggest that it was intended to apply to people, uh, the, the money that people had previously paid into the system. And it wasn't voluntarily paid, it was required to be paid. Um, we well, you haven't- just, you, You've just heard what opposing counsel has said. What is your response to him? With regard to the clause that's now in PA 300 that it applies to people who were hired before September 4, 2012, right. well, that, that phrase has other significance in the amendments that were uh, reenacted through PA 300. PA 300 cut off re eligibility for the retiree health care system for anybody hired after September 4, 2012. It speaks only to whom 43E applies. It doesn't explain to what. 43E applies. And this is important because there's, uh, at this point in time, I think I'd like to make a, a clarification. There's two 43Es. There's PA 75's version of 43E, and there's PA 300's version of 43E. 43E initially said, beginning July 10th, 2000, or July 1st, 2010, the 3% three, the, the 3 contribution will be taken away from the member's compensation. We know from, from definitions within the Retirement Act under Section 3A, compensation means uh, remuneration for services already performed or services already rendered. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but words to that effect. With 43E in uh, Public Act 300, you had a, a dramatic shift. In fact, this is what this court ultimately ruled was what allowed PA 300 to be upheld is you had a voluntary scheme. Um, PA 300, or I'm sorry, Section 43 in PA 300 doesn't simply replicate the 43E that existed under PA 75. It wasn't simply reproduced, Xeroxed, and, and left in place. 
there were a couple of substantial changes to 43E. 43E was um, no longer, it no longer included in it this notion that beginning July 1st, 2010, these contributions would continue. They took out that reference. And taking out that reference started way back in, in March of 2012 with the original SB 1040 bill. What also was different with PA 300 and its version of for, Section 43E is that it conditions it on 91A. Section 91A is an entirely new provision in the Retirement Act. When you look at the Retirement Act, it didn't exist before September 4th, 2012. So now you've got 43E, which includes a condition, and it's this condition which provides the choice, the voluntary aspects of PA 300, because if you look at 91A5, that's where the opt-out provision is. Look at 91A. That's the fruit of your opt-out, or the, the fallback of your opt-out. But this is only with respect to the new 43E and the extractions taken under the new authority of 43E. It, you can't just assume it goes back. Our jurisprudence in this state assumes prospective application only. It doesn't assume that, we're, that this money was intended to apply to, to the two years worth of uh, extractions that were taken previously. Um, and in this regard, you, you've got two different statutes. The only comparison is that they have the same number, but substantially they're different in application. One was a mandatory dictate, one is a permissive voluntary decision. Um, the, the jurisprudence of our state requires that if you're going to apply something retroactively, it has to be clear, direct, and unequivocal. We've seen a connect the dots kind of analysis here of, well, if you look over here and then you jump back here and you kind of assume that this or imply here that by talking about September 4, 2012, we, we met the money that was taken from those people. We can't make those kind of jumps. We have to be very clear. The legislature had to be very clear and they know. They've used the magic words before, both before this act and both after this act. We're gonna apply this retroactively. They've said it. They're very clear about it when they do. And in this situation, they haven't said that. In fact, at the time that PA 300 was actually passed and signed into law, there was a Court of Appeals decision that said that PA 75 was unconstitutional. And there was an order that said, give the people their money back. The legislature is presumed to know that. And if they wanted to affect somehow the money that was previously taken and somehow reach back and capture it through PA 300, there has to be a clear, direct, and unequivocal intention of doing so. And it's just lacking in this situation. The only exception to, to the presumption for prospective application of uh, new legislation is if it's remedial. Remedial in the sense that uh, it's not making a substantive change. The decisions of this court previously have all said that if you're going to make a substantive change to the, to the law, you can't presume that it's a remedial change. Think of PA 75 as a flat tire. All right, on the car that is the retirement system. Sometimes you can go back and patch it with a, with a little, whatever they do at the, at the tire store, they patch it. And it can still continue driving the car. In this case, they didn't patch it. They put a whole new tire on. They put a tire on that has with it a whole new set of substantive rights. And this court has already determined that that new tire works. Car keeps driving along. But in, in, in this situation, it's not a remedial fix. It's a whole new tire. It's, it's a whole new sense of statutory uh, conditions. And by making it um, such, it can't be applied retroactively. Um, and, and that's what's important when we, when we look at the, the remedial and, and the, the remedial aspects of this case that are argued by the state versus the um, uh, presumption of prospectivity only. Um, Council, I understand your, your metaphor. I'm just not quite sure I understand exactly what the consequence is of PA 300 being the new car PA 75 being the tire, and why that relationship can't be applied or meshed together in some kind of retroactive way. I mean, what, 
what help me understand why the metaphor stands in the way of that, that kind of relationship. Well, it was thought up this morning, so I, you know. It, <laughs> The point of of it is, is PA three hundred isn't a new car. I'm sure it's my fault that I don't no, no. follow. No, PA three hundred. Unless I don't. PA PA three hundred isn't the new car. It's the new tire. PA seventy five in this analogy, uh, or in this uh, metaphor, was the flat tire. And at times you can fix a flat tire and keep it in, intact uh, with a small patch, but other times you got to put a whole new tire on. And that's what PA three hundred is. You guys have acknowledged. Uh, in your decision on PA 300, that it was a whole new set of whole new set of rules, and by implementing that whole new set of rules, there was um, uh, an entirely uh, different substantive nature to the extractions. Um, I, I hope that answers your question and clarifies your question. Um, the import of the, the analogy or the metaphor is that. PA 300 was not just simply a, a remedial action that, that should be given retroactive application. PA 300 was a new substantive set of laws um, and conditions uh, that simply can only be pro applied prospectively only. You know, as, as you look at this case... Do you, have any, do you have any specific response to opposing counsel's contention on the retroactivity point when he referred me to, I believe, 91A, subsection 8, and how that interacts with um, 1343E. Well, 91A8 was a, a new addition to the Retirement Act by PA 300. It didn't exist under PA 75. The conditions uh, and the guarantees uh, provided by 91A um, are attached to the, the election that it was made elsewhere under 91A, and that's 91A5. I think it was this court who, who indicated that it's uh, two sides of the same coin. The, by, by agreeing to the election and the opt-out of 91A5, you were agreeing that you were fine with the, the refund provisions of 91A8. 91A8, though, as I, as I talked earlier, is part of the new the new 43E, the new Retirement Act. 43E, in its newer version, not the prior PA75 version, now conditions application of the 3% deduction on, on 91A. And in 91A, oh, I, I, can continue. If I can continue, thank you. Uh, 91A uh, simply says uh, you have a choice under sub 5. And then 91A, 91A8 says, if for some reason, you, when you make that choice to remain in the retirement system, if you do not otherwise qualify for retiree health care during the course of your career, when you turn age 60, you're going to be entitled to this separate retirement allowance. But again, that's applied prospectively your, only. Your, your point is, if, just to try to simplify it, because I know we're at the end of your time, is that that scheme set up in 91A8 still would make sense, or make sense, period, if it only relates to contributions made after the effective date of Act 300. Is that your point? Absolutely. It only applies to the, to the deductions or the contributions after September 4, 2012. I know that you believe that, but the point is the way that the, the statute is written, it, it works. It works on a going forward basis. In other words, it doesn't only work if Correct. it was a looking back at funds already collected. Correct. You know, if I can quote something from your prior decision on PA 300 at pages 205 to 206, the court described 91A8 to provide a separate re retirement allowance for public school employees who elect to pay the 3% contribution, but who then subsequently fail to qualify for retiree health care benefits. That election didn't exist under PA 75, and, and that acknowledgement means that 91A8 applies going forward because the election didn't come into play until September 4, 2012 with the enactment of PA 300. Um, just to wrap up, overall, I, I thank you for the additional time. Overall, your decision in this case in affirming the Court of Appeals will have no impact on PA 300 moving forward. The case at bar is simply about a, a, a specific pot of money that was taken illegally from individuals of the public school retirement system 
and we're just seeking to return to back to whom it rightfully belongs. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Counsel. Good afternoon. I am Mark Cousins, appearing on behalf of the AFT Michigan plaintiffs. The parties returned to the court uh, to complete the work begun with this court's consideration of 2012 PA 300. That decision left outstanding the status of the money that was taken from some 200,000 public school employees uh, who are, as the court can imagine, very interested in the outcome of this case. The PA 300 decision was based upon individual consent. PA 300 was constitutional, this court held, because public school employees had a choice and could opt in or opt out of participation. The court reserved questions with regard to the PA uh, 75 money, and so left unresolved is the question of the extraction of money between July 1st of 2010 and roughly uh, January 9th of 2013. I'm going to address whether the involuntary extraction under what is called the mandatory period is so unreasonable as to be unconstitutional. The starting point for this analysis is that no one ever consented to the PA 75 extractions. PA 300 was constitutional because public school employees are given a choice. They could opt in or they could opt out. And those who opted in consented to the future extractions and the terms of the refund mechanism. I argued to this court without success that the refund mechanism was unconstitutional and this court held that the individuals who participated consented to it, so be it. But the consent that was given under PA 300 is prospective, not retroactive. Why? Because no one asked public school employees if they, uh, as part of the PA 300 consent, if they agreed to the PA 75, 75 extractions. The statute doesn't reference it. There is no form, no waiver, uh, nothing of that sort. No one asked public school employees if it was okay with them that 3% was taken under PA uh, 75. And so those extractions were always involuntary. They were never consented to. Now, the second point that is crucial here is, despite some suggestions to the contrary by representatives of the defendant state of Michigan, none of the money paid under PA 75 inured to the benefit of the people who were paying it. There have been a lot of uh, suggestions that this is, they are paying into their fund or they're paying for their own benefits. Indeed, at one point in their briefs, the state said they are paying for their own benefits. None of those statements are true. Each one of them is completely false. No one paying benefited from the PA 75 extractions because that money went directly into the PA 77 trust, that's what the statute says, and was used contemporaneously to pay for post-employment retiree health care of persons then retired. This didn't benefit, PA 75 did not benefit the viability of the retirement fund. It had nothing to do with the general fund that is uh, administered by the Office of Retirement Services. It went only for uh, retiree health care. Now, by contrast, PA 300 does. PA 300 does endure to the benefit of those paying who opt in because the retirement fund gets additional uh, resources. PA 300 was designed to raise revenue for the retirement fund and does so by increasing the contributions that public school employees must pay. Can you but, just clarify for me, wasn't PA 300 also enacted to try to redress the apparent lack of constitutionality of aspects of PA 75? PA 300 is indeed a fix. It is not, re quote, remedial legislation. Remedial legislation, as this court knows, is designed to address some kind of social... But uh, what does that mean to be a fix? It was intended to render something valid that had been previously deemed invalid. And it does do that prospectively. What PA 300 does is to create the opt-in, opt-out. And therefore, uh, PA 300 does not have the infirmity that PA 75 does. So they didn't deal remedially with PA 75 because either A, they forgot about it, or B, it was too expensive to fix, 
What was the rationale for the legislature not responding as you would have thought a legislature would following a determination that one of their earlier enactments was invalid? Justice Markman, <clears throat> I would be remiss if I tried to guess what was in the mind of the Michigan legislature at the time they enacted PA3. <laughs> I only know what the statute says. The statute does not address PA75, and the statute, by its terms, is not retrospective. This court has made very clear what the legislature should do when it wishes to make a statute uh, retroactive or retrospective. Uh, in LaFontaine uh, versus Chrysler, the court articulated this. It's very clear the legislature has to say the statute is retrospective, and PA 300 does not do that. Not only that, but it appears clear that it applies to antecedent events because the consent uh, the opportunity for consent opens up on September 4th of 2012 and continued for a period of time which ultimately the legislature had to extend because it was so unreasonable. So as a result, it is my view uh, that PA 300 is not retrospective and because of that, the refund mechanism does not apply. But even if it does apply, it doesn't solve the problem because the consent to participate in the refund mechanism under PA 300 was prospective. When people were asked if they wished to opt in or opt out, uh, those who opted in consented to the refund mechanism, but they did so effective the date of their consent. How do I know that? Well, it's my turn for a metaphor. Uh, suppose I'm walking out to the parking lot and someone comes up to me and demands my wallet. I give it to them in fear of my life. A week later, they find me and apologize and say, here's your wallet back, I'm so sorry. Now, I can forgive them their offense, but I can't consent to it retroactively because at the time they took my wallet, they took it without my consent. That's PA 75. While PA 300 may indeed uh, permit consent and opt in and opt out, it does so prospectively. So where does that leave us? PA 75 is simply arbitrary. It is unreasonable and unfair. It's of no benefit to the people who paid the money. Uh, it's not protected, but even if it is, it's uh, prospective, and therefore the court should conclude that PA 75 is unconstitutional. PA 75 is dramatically different than PA 300. PA 75 impacts a fundamental right, namely property. The money that is taken is the property of the public school employee who earned it. That money is accrued, and it takes it without their consent. This law is unique in the history of the state, at least as far as I can tell. The defendant can't decide what it is. Oh, here it's a tax. No, it's a, an excise fund. It's neither of those. It's not a tax because it has to, the statute would have to state the tax, and it doesn't. It's not an excise. Uh, fee because an excise fee is money in exchange for some benefit and there is no benefit. What a PA 75 actually is, is the taking of money from A to give to B. The, an act which the United States Supreme Court in 1796 found unacceptable in Calder versus Bull. It is simply the arbitrary exercise of state power. Now, the doctrine of substantive due process, which for some is kind of a dirty phrase, um, has been recognized by the United States Supreme Court and by this court. It, I view it as a circuit breaker. The right to substantive due process is violated when legislation is unreasonable and clearly arbitrary, having no substantial relationship to the health, safety, morals, or general welfare of the public. When the legislature impacts fundamental rights and does so in a way which is arbitrary, the Constitution is violated. How do we know this is a fundamental right? Property is listed as one of the three rights specifically mentioned in the 14th Amendment. Life, liberty, or property. Property is a fundamental right and money is property. It's a fundamental right, but of course it can be violated if sufficient due process uh, accompanies it, and uh, that due process was arguably accompanying it here where the legislature enacted this. Respectfully, Justice Markman, I disagree. 
uh, the court would be correct if we were referring to uh, procedural You're not process. disagreeing with me. I'm asking a question. I'm not No, uh, I do not believe that that is true because due process in this situation would be procedural due process where money was taken pursuant to a judgment following a hearing and notice an opportunity to respond. That's not what happened here. The legislature said pay up. And there is no or else in the statute, but it's implied because the statute is, in essence, an order to the public school employer to take the money out of the paycheck of the person who has already earned it. And therefore, you have to ask the question, why these people? The selection of public school employees, of current public school employees, to pay for a benefit provided to people who are currently retired is unreasonable. They're not paying for their own benefits. PA 75 guarantees them nothing because it's subject to studier. No one consented to the extraction. And there's simply no nexus between current public school employees and then current retirees, except that they once worked for a public school. So why did the legislature select this group to fund retiree health care for others? They are paying to provide health care to people currently retired on a current basis. It's not going into a fund which is used ultimately to protect them. When it was adopted, PA 75 took money without consent and without any suggestion that there was an assurance of benefit for those who were paying. The state of Michigan never explains why this is so because it can't. It relies on presumptions uh, that the uh, statute is presumed to be constitutional. Yes, we know that. Um, it, that the legislature can make policy. Yes, we know that. But what if the legislature makes dumb policy? And that's what this is. PA 75 was a mistake. Well, that's the question. Is dumb policy the equivalent of unconstitutional policy? If the policy itself is arbitrary. The legislature can be in error. It can make mistakes. and. That itself is not unconstitutional. But when the mistake that it makes uh, is arbitrary, when it impacts a discrete group of people, specifically for the benefit of another discrete group of people, with no nexus between the two, it's not only dumb policy, it's unconstitutional. PA 75 is unconstitutional because it takes money from one discrete group of people and gives it to another discrete group of people. And therefore, I respectfully suggest that the court see this as what it is, which is a substantial overreach by the legislature. True, they were trying to solve a problem, but the way in which they did it was so uh, fraught with error that the legislature itself recognized that it had to fix it and finally did in PA 300. And therefore, the Court of Appeals should be affirmed. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. May it please the court, Robert Fetter, Miller Cohen, on behalf of the plaintiffs in the Johnson case. Uh, the group that I represent are all members of AFSCME, the American Federation of State, County, Municipal Employees. Uh, they are custodians, bus drivers, food service workers, facility maintenance employees, uh, and, and if you ever meet any, you know that they have a passion for fostering a safe and healthy environment uh, for the children of the state to be able to learn. In most cases, they do this uh, for wages that are hardly a living wage. When the state confiscated 3% of their wages, it had disastrous consequences on their own personal budgets for their families. Uh, but first, I want to discuss the impairment claim. The state has attempted to characterize its action in many ways. I think it has a difficult time categorizing really what it did. But setting that aside, the Court of Appeals described it simply and correctly when it said that the state ordered employers to not pay 3% of the wages to their employees and instead pay it to the state in the form of an employer contribution. Despite this obvious circumstance, the state argues that the contracts are not impaired because the employers are still paying the contracted wages. 
which they are not. They are paying 3% of those contracted wages to the state. It is simply not a true characterization. For purposes of impairment, if you were to think, if one of the actual employers did this, after having a contract for a particular wage rate and said, we're going to take 3% of your wages and do something else with it, uh, you know, some opportunity maybe that you're going to get some retiree benefit. Or maybe we'll take 3% of your wages and buy lottery tickets. Whatever they do with that 3% wages, it is an impairment of their contract. And moreover, that is why I believe that the Court of Appeals characterization is right on. Uh, the state cannot make a good faith argument that this impairment was not substantial. The best they can do is to muster an argument that conflates substantial impairment with other factors and sometimes other factors of other constitutional uh, issues. Uh, they say that, well, they're getting something for it. Well, that doesn't matter whether it's an impairment in the beginning or not, uh, which we don't agree that they're getting anything for it. Uh, at most, they're getting an illusory agreement uh, that they might get retiree health care when they retire. They say that the, uh, it's only temporary. Well, at the time of its passage, it wasn't temporary, A. B, the, uh, whether it's temporary or not, impairing a contract substantially, uh, and this was for about two and a half years they ended up doing it, uh, isn't relevant as to whether it's, it's temporary or not. An impairment is impairment. Um, now, consistent with the precedent cited in our brief, uh, much less has been found to be substantial. Now, there is a question as to the amount of deference that the state should receive as to the reasonableness of their action. In determining this factor, the amount of deference given is, is determined as whether the state is self-interested. There can be no doubt in this case that the state is self-interested. Not only are public schools a creation of the state, a political subdivision of the state, they are funded primarily by the state. And in fact, the state is obligated to make up any shortfalls for, under the retirement system, including retirement health care, that it may have in funding. So by creating this other revenue stream for funding, it helps shore up directly the general fund money of the state. Uh, and if that's not enough, the statute itself describes its actions as essential functions of the state. So undoubtedly, the state is self-interested. Therefore, the state is not afforded the deference that it desires. And the best evidence under the Contracts Clause as to whether the action was reasonable is PA 300. So number, the first issue is, did they look at other alternatives prior to impairing contracts? And as Justice Bernstein had asked, uh, they did not. This was the first and direct option. They did not look at anything more moderate. But after the Court of Appeals had found that PA 75 was unconstitutional, they did find other options that were constitutional, which was PA 300. By merely making the option to pay the 3% voluntary, it rendered what was unconstitutional constitutional. That was a more moderate approach, and it served the means that they sought to accomplish. Now, PA 300 had other issues with, with pensions and increased contributions to those and other issues. But as to the retiree health care, it solved the matter in a way that did not trample on the right to contract. If we assume there was an impairment, um, was it remedied, as opposing counsel suggests, by enactment of Act 300? No, it was not. As my brother counsels have, have discussed regarding retroactivity, uh, the statute, PA 300 was not retroactive. It did not remedy uh, the confiscation of the $550 million that was taken prior to its enactment. There is nowhere in that statute where it addressed that issue. If you look at, again, Section 43E, that applies to, there's a cutoff period. Those after September 2012 do not have to contribute the 3% because they are not eligible 
for retiree health care. Those that were members before that do have to contribute the 3% subject to their option to opt out. There is no reference in there at all to the funds that were collected under PA 75. If we disagree and find that it was retroactive, did it remedy the violation? It still didn't remedy the violation because the refund mechanism is insufficient. Why? Because uh, counsel for the state had stated that they get all their money back 20, 30 years from now, plus interest. So one reason why it doesn't remedy it is that in order to have just compensation under the takings clause, or to be able to provide a, a remedy for the impairment, it has to be without delay. Under the Dolan case, uh, the delay of that amount of time doesn't cut it. Second of all, and I'm glad you let me say this because I may have missed it, it's a small point, but it fits in perfect here, is they say it's with interest. With interest. The interest is statutorily 1.5% a year with no compounding. That is not the interest earned on their money. It is uh, interest that somebody could have in a savings account and get a better return. It is not the interest earned on their money. The state will be able to still retain the amount of money above the 1.5% per year uncompounded. If we uh, conclude that there was an impairment do we uh, get to the issue of whether it was remedied in light of the stipulated order that your brother counsel referred to? I'm sorry, can you repeat your question, sir? If we conclude that there was a constitutional violation along the theory that you're suggesting, do we even get to the issue of remedy, whether it was remedied by Act 300 in light of the stipulated order that your brother counsel referred to where the state apparently agreed that if Section 43 was found unconstitutional that the money would be paid back plus interest. I would believe that under the stipulation that's been entered in this case, that if there is a constitutional violation, the money is to be paid back. That's what the parties have stipulated to. I don't have the direct language of that stipulation in front of me, but from my memory, that is what it provides. And all the plaintiffs entered into a similar stipulation? Justice Viviano, you asked me to recall what happened uh, six years ago procedurally, which I should be able to answer, but I believe we all did. I think it was, it was across the board in all three cases, but I, I can't say that I, with, with a well, that's great fine. level I of I didn't certainty. intend to put you on the spot, and it was apparently a little over seven years ago, September 8, 2010, <laughs> according I to believe that was the case. All right. So as to the takings, we really have to ask three questions. Uh, did the state take plaintiff's property? Was it a physical taking or a regulatory taking? And did the state provide just compensation? Well, once wages are earned, undoubtedly under the law and the statutes of the state of Michigan, is property of the employee. The employee performs services and they deserve to earn a contractual wage. Once they perform those services, those, they have a vested accrued right to those wages. The state argues that those wages are not taking property of the employee, but instead, public employee wages are public property. And they cite cases uh, that have been specifically overturned by constitutional amendment. However, they confuse these cases and the timing and the character of the money. We don't doubt that once the state, say under P PA 30, or 300, I'm sorry, uh, takes the money and puts it into a state account that it's state property. But prior to doing that, at the time of the taking, it is undoubtedly the employee's property. As we state in our brief, this, if you follow the state's position is that they can, you know, they can't come and steal your wallet, but they can steal all the money out of the wallet. And that doesn't make any sense. So they also argue that since the employees had notice that the state was going to take their money after they earned it, that this destroyed the vested nature of their money. And that is, by definition, circular reasoning. The state tells you, passes a statute, that we're going to take a takings 
any time that they pass a statute, which ends up in a takings, there would never be a takings claim under the Constitution. Uh, this is a physical taking, not a regulatory taking. The state is self-interested in this transaction. That takes the analysis out of regulatory takings alone. This is not regulating a relationship between two private parties. This is a state-funded and state-administered program. The statute itself admits, again, that it is an essential function of the state. In that regard, Webb's Fabulous Pharmacy is very analogous in that regard. In no situation the state has presented is there just compensation. In truth, the plaintiffs only received an illusory promise of maybe they'll receive retiree health care when they get, when they're of age to retire. The state asserts that someday, I'm sorry, the refund provisions of PA 300 do not apply to the mandatory payments under PA 75. And there is no reference. There is no denying that the legislature knew at the time that they passed PA 300 that there was this money sitting in an escrow account. However, that money that was confiscated under PA 75 is completely without reference in PA 300. If you follow the normal rules of retroactivity, that must be specifically referenced to go back and retroactively apply the terms of PA 300 to the money confiscated under PA 75. There is no specific reference. Then we get into this discussion of is it a remedial statute, which is a very narrow exception to the general rule that it has to be specifically referenced. It has to be explicit. Now what were they remedying? Were they attempting to remedy the fact that they took $550 million? Or were they trying to fix an unconstitutional statute moving forward? And I think the only way to make that determination is to read the language of the statute. They were moving forward going to have a constitutional program by making it voluntary. There is, again, no reference to the money that was taken under PA 75. If they were trying to go back and again, as Brother Counsel had said, and, and, and somehow grab that money too, there would have to be some reference to it. Some reference. And there is none. The only intent of the legislature that they were attempting to remedy was the constitutional violation going forward. The state today, uh, although initially we had a discussion about it being a tax, uh, which they try to, they've, they've gone to and gone away from in different parts of this litigation, uh, described this as a user fee. And we discussed that issue in our brief, and a user fee, in order to be constitutionally sufficient and not be a takings, if you'll allow me just to finish briefly, I'm sorry. Please, please, please finish. Um, has to be voluntary. The mandatory nature of PA 75 renders, even if it is a user fee, which we disagree with that characterization, still renders it uh, unconstitutional. And the only assertion or defense they can make to that is that if you don't like the user fee, you can, of course, quit. Uh, and we don't think that that is an acceptable uh, solution for our educators and those that work in our schools. Uh, respectfully, we ask you to affirm the decision of the Court of Fields, and I thank you very much. Thank you, Counsel. You have about three and a half minutes to go. Thank you. Your, uh, your Mr. Honor. Gordon, do we get to the issue, if we find there to be an impairment, you, 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 you left off talking about whether that impairment was remedied by Act 300. Do we even get to that issue in light of the stipulation? <clears throat> the... Uh, the stipulation in light of Act 300 would, would, in essence, act as some kind of unjust enrichment because Act 300 provides for the money to go into uh, the, uh, the trust fund. The money is, has been uh, designated in Act 300 as 
uh, monies that should go forward into the trust fund and in the trust fund the monies are dealt with as any other monies under Act 300. I mean, that so, sort of begs the question of the whole case, doesn't it? Well, the, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I mean, the whole question Mariano. of the case is whether the Act 300 pertains, specifically pertains to these funds. But I, I, I asked you a, a more specific question, which is if there was a constitutional violation with the prior version of 38.1343E, the state apparently agreed if there was a finding to that uh, degree that it would repay the money. And so we have these other interesting issues of retroactivity. And if it, if it is retroactive, then is it sufficient, as I was talking to your opposing counsel about? But my yeah. question for you is, what's the impact of this stipulation? The stipulation was entered into before uh, Act 300 was ever contemplated, I right? think Act, I'm sorry. Right? I mean, so it's, it's uh, yeah, 2010. my understanding that it was. But Act 300, I think, uh, super, would, would also act to uh, supersede that because it deals with it uh, repairs any constitutional infirmities that allegedly were part of Act 75. Under the uh, Act 75, the contributions started under Section 43E. They continue under Section 43E under Act 300 also. The way the, the funds are treated is that under Act 300, is that they're deposited into the trust fund. The trust fund is regulated on a present basis, not a retroactive basis, but on a present basis by uh, Section 91A of Act 300. So that constitutional infirmity has been remedied. What to do with the funds, even if Act 75 without Act 300 were found to be unconstitutional is remedied and addressed specifically by the legislature. Let and me ask you then the follow-up question. If there was an impairment, a constitutional violation, and if Act 300 was designed, as you suggest, to remedy it, and if Act 300 was retroactive, so we're pretty far down the road, I suppose, um, why would we, uh, or why should we find that 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 it did remedy the violation it, because, uh, or without providing the plaintiff teachers with the option of obtaining an immediate refund as one of the options that were presented. It was a long question, so if you didn't understand it, I, I can try to restate it. But in order to, if there was a constitutional violation, in order to cure it, didn't the legislature have to give at least as one of the many options presented? You know, you can opt in, you can opt out, you can do this, you can do that. You know, if, the, if we find that the legislature, or that the contract was impaired, the money was taken illegally, in order to cure that, don't you have to at least offer as one option, we'll give you your money back? And, and that option has been offered. And as part of the well, statute, there was no offer. It's well, not immediate, immediate. There was no immediate refund offer. No, unless you're, I'm you're reading There's statute. no immediate refund uh, of the money, but there is a well, refund. Well, they said of you the can money. opt in, or you can opt out. But if you opt out, we're putting your money in a 401k, and you could get it later, or presumably you could get it now and play it, pay a penalty. And there's all these different, you know, decision matrix things that you can think through. But what's missing, I think, or maybe, is the option to get an immediate refund. But does that make it unconstitutional? We don't think so, because well, they are question, going. My question was a convoluted question, but it, as a condition of my question, there would be already a finding that well, the contract was impaired in an unconstitutional at, way. Yes, and, and and we disagree with that. But even with that finding, I, it's a hypothetical. I'm not. I I'm understand, just asking. Justice, and, but even under your hypothetical, the people will be made whole. Does it have to be made whole tomorrow? Or in a week, I don't think the case law says that. They are going to be made whole with interest at some point. Is that now, genuine? They're going to be made whole with interest at a later date. I mean, the question here is, is, is and I think what Justice Viano is trying to get at is, is that a really genuine thing, what you're saying? Isn't, if you're going to try to, if we're talking about what a taking is, 
isn't the only way to kind of satisfy the issue of what a taking is, is to make the people whole, which means to give them their money. And, and they will get their money back. But Not that's tomorrow. where we're going back and forth. We are going back and forth. But the, the bottom line that none of us can deny is the fact that people will receive all of their contributions. And I think this probably, there are probably very few people that we're talking about here because most people, by paying 3% getting retiree health care, I mean, you know, what a deal. The, you know, and, and with the cost of retiree health care, I doubt if there are very many people that opt out of that. The question, the one question that I think remained uh, uh, dangling. I mean, it's one and a half percent interest. Is that really interest? Well, it has been lately for me, Your Honor, with all Where due you respect. I mean, maybe, I mean, but, but my assumption is these are school employees. Maybe they know how to invest better than you do. <laughs> they, they, they probably do. But, the, uh, but then if they probably do, shouldn't it then really be their choice? It's their money. Well, it's not your there, money. there is a question, you know, uh, on the case law that we cited, uh, there is public money. And the, the cases that are cavalierly dismissed because they're old, they date to 1915 and 1929, uh, and they address pension benefits. And pension benefits so I, I now think what are, Justice Viano is asking, which is the same question I'm asking, and I apologize, I do apologize for belaboring it, is if we hold that this is a taking, the question is, if you hold that something is a taking, isn't the only way to really make somebody whole, if, you, if, if it's unconstitutional, the conduct of what the state did, if that's what we hold, isn't the only real remedy for the immediately dispersion of funds to the people in which the property slash money was ultimately taken from? Not later, not in the future, not maybe, not in some other context, not in some other capacity, but to give them their actual money that was taken from them. Isn't that really the significant option that's really being discussed here on the table? And I guess, really, we're going to go back and forth, but this is the question I have for you. If you hold that a taking is unconstitutional, and if you hold that a taking is money, and if you hold that it was taken improperly, what other recourse is offered than to immediately return the taking to the people in which it was taken from. Well, well you're, you're missing the, the fact, or we are missing the fact, that they also receive current death penalty and disability benefits. They also are able to sustain the viability of the system that might not have been allowed to go forward. Remember, but the, then that the goes legislature could have just that, pulled that the plug. In, but that goes back into our whole other issue which is then we need to have a discussion about the, quali the, the question of impairment and the question of substantial impairment, which was, have the state, if, do you feel the state has been able to demonstrate that before, look, if before you took this action, before you did what you ultimately did, you have to demonstrate that you did other things, that you looked at other options, that you scaled every mountain. I mean, if the, if the con if a taking is a serious thing, under the Constitution. So in order to satisfy the definition here, you have to be able to show that you took advantage of other remedies before you went to this. Well, and if you can't show that you took advantage of other remedies. The analysis you're speaking to only applies when the person providing the funds receives, number one, no benefit. Number two, it only applies then we go back to when the, whole the taking. Issue of who, but then we go back to the whole issue of who gets the benefit. And you haven't been able to show that the people in which the, the taking was done were the ones who actually received the benefit. Well, to uh, have ongoing opportunity for future health care, to have a current death and disability benefit that's covered by those funds. But the second aspect that you're missing, with all due respect, Justice, is that in order to engage in the analysis you're speaking of, the state has to take the money for the state's use. The government unit has to take it for their own use. They aren't doing that here. They're not taking the money and they're building a road. They're not taking the money and, and covering some but other not deficit giving it the, but the it's budget. Not going to the, but it's not going to the benefit of the individuals in which it was taken from. That's where we're having this discussion. Well, I, I, that's where we have a, a respectful disagreement. Whose benefit is it going to? It's certainly not to the state, 
It, it, may, uh, it may benefit the, uh, the school districts by reducing the amount of money they're required to pay into the funds, but there is a current benefit and an ongoing benefit to those people who have made that and are making that contribution. That's where we, we, we respectfully disagree. Can I ask you one, one more question, uh, Mr. Gordon, if I can urge you to respond quickly to it, I'd appreciate that too. At the very outset of your remarks, your argument today, you mentioned the financial circumstances of the state and what you viewed as some of the difficult straits in that regard. What is the conceivable constitutional relevance of that, if any? Well, that gives the, uh, the uh, state, the, the uh, reasonableness of the contribution it can go to, the benefit that the employees receive, because at that point in time, the legislature, while, while the, uh, the uh, plaintiffs have, have continually harped on this, it's not a so-called vested benefit, the legislature could have said, we aren't going to fund health care benefits at all. Uh, and now we're in the future, because, and, and they didn't choose to do so. So I think the, the reasonableness of the contribution, the proportionality of the benefit that the, the individuals receive because they prevent this health care plan from, from crashing under Article 4, Section 51 of the Constitution. The legislature has the plenary authority to enact uh, laws for the uh, uh, welfare of its, of its uh, uh, citizens. And certainly, uh, it is an appropriate act uh, to provide for health care benefits for public employees. For so the public employees. employees' constitutional rights fluctuate depending on the financial health and stability of the state? No. Okay. That, that goes to the, uh, some of the factors that are utilized in analyzing whether it, it was a reasonable act by the state. It has to go in your judgment. It goes to the, I guess, the prongs of the impairment analysis as they pertain to the substantiality of the impairment and whether the impairment is reasonable and necessary. Is that what you're saying? That's true, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you very much, Thank Counsel. You. Thank you. Thank you all. We submit this case.